we're going back to another part of the world. Another place, another way of thinking, and you're coming to a feast. We have to take you back in time. And more than just taking you back in time, we have to take your mind and insert it into the mind of a disciple, into the mind of those who lived back in those days. How did they think? How did they relate to things? How did they relate to, well, our favorite subject here tonight? How did they relate to food? So let's take you back in time and let's see how all of this works. 2,000 years. We're going back to another part of the world, another place, another way of thinking, and you're coming to a feast at my house, and I want you to be there. You are to be my guest of honor. And so what I do is that I send out a servant to invite you. You're in another village. You're toiling away in the field with a stick, scratching furrows in the ground and scattering seed, hoping that something's going to grow because this is what you do. And as you are doing so, working away in the field, suddenly my servant comes up to you and Lark is working in the field and my servant sees you and says, are you Lark? And you say, yes I am. My master is doing a feast and he has invited you to be the guest of honor. You will be there. Yes, right answer. Of course, you wouldn't want to miss a feast of that magnitude because people didn't get a chance to go to them very often back then. And I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. But it's a great honor to be invited to a feast. And so I have your yes, I am leaving, and the servant leaves. Back then, the Jewish people, well, they did keep holy days. They did keep Sabbath days. And they timed themselves by such things. But beyond that, time meant very little to these people. And so if I were to come to Lark and say, you will be coming to a feast, and she says, yes, I know she's going to be there. And what's going to happen? My servant will show up later, weeks later, whatever it might be, and say, my master has got the feast prepared. He's killed the fatted calf. It's tomorrow. And so she gets up and she puts a few stale particles of bread in a little bag and puts an animal skin full of water over her shoulder, gets her walking stick, and off she goes to my house. And there when she arrives, as she's coming up to the door, I see her coming and I'm very excited to see her. And of course, I'm going to greet her in the typical Jewish manner. As she comes up to the door, I'm going to say, peace, peace be unto you. Your turn. You see, in ancient times, they would have spoken the religious language of the day along with an Aramaic dialect, but they would have spoken in Hebrew to one another, and it would have come out like this. Peace be unto you is Shalom Alechem. Your turn. Not bad. I heard a little bit of California accent in there, and the response is Alechem Ha Shalom. But this shalom, shalom alechem, it really is in the Bible. In fact, it's in the Bible in a very interesting place. After Jesus rose from the dead, well, we know that day. We celebrate it with pageants and very great vast musicals and hallelujah choruses and the whole thing. Jesus is risen. But if you read the story in the Bible, you find, yes, it was really the greatest day in all Christian history, in the world history. But the disciples that day didn't know how to take it. John saw and believed. Peter was really perplexed about the whole thing. And the rest of the disciples were just downright scared. And that Easter Sunday morning, which we celebrate, well, don't forget about that afternoon and especially that evening. That evening of Easter Sunday, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the disciples aren't out prancing through the street shouting, He is risen. In fact, they're locked in a room. And they locked themselves in. They shuttered the windows. They bolted the doors. And there inside the room they are cowering because they know that, well, they got Jesus, maybe they're going to get us next. And the events of the day really troubled them. It really didn't make them happy at first. And so there they are in the midst of the room and suddenly Jesus appears miraculously in the room. He just shows up. And he says to his disciples, Shalom Aleichem. And his disciples said, No, they said nothing. They were terrified. They thought he was a ghost. 
But you see it happened there and it happened one later and the greeting comes peace be unto you because they were definitely not at peace but eventually they became that way and Jesus blessed them. Well, now there's another part to the greeting here. And I, I would like, Pastor Vic, if you would please come up here and help me with this one. As Vic comes up here, I would say to Vic, now we're greeting one another, Shalom Aleichem, and you would say, and then I would put my hands on your shoulders and you would put your hands on my shoulders and I would give you a holy kiss. Ah! <laughs> now, I know the stress level just went up in the room, an awful lot, because you're thinking, you're not going to make me do this, are you? Yeah, why not? This is the way they greeted one another. The Bible even says, greet one another with a holy kiss. Well, that's a holy kiss. And by the way, we're Americans, and we don't greet one another this way. But we're about the only people in the world who don't. Because even if you go to South America or to Australia or to other places, people give each other holy kisses. Sometimes it's one peck, sometimes it's two, and in the Middle East, typically it's three. Well. When you greet one another with a holy kiss here, because we're 2,000 years ago and in the Middle East, it's three pecks, one peck on each cheek, one, two, three, with your hands on each other's shoulders. As you would come into my house, well, you would kick your sandals off and uh, you would enter my house as you stepped over the threshold. Well, I'm gonna ask you to leave your shoes on unless you really wanna take them off. And now, as you have come into my house, you would make yourself at home and I would ask you to please sit down. Well, you've come into my house, and as you have come in to join me and to be with me, I am now going to bestow upon you that which is customary to do. I am now going to give you four gifts of hospitality, and you would expect these gifts. In fact, if I didn't give you these gifts, you would consider me a really big sinner. I would be considered a very wicked man, in fact, if I didn't give you these gifts. And more than that, if I didn't give you these gifts of hospitality, you would also believe that your whole village, my whole village, was that way. My goodness, they judged people by the group back then just as easily as we do today. And so if I didn't give you these gifts, you would think, oh, the whole village must be just terrible. And so I'm going to give you these four gifts of hospitality. Now. The first gift that I would give you, very practical, very simple. I would offer to wash your feet. The feet in those days and in the Middle East today is considered the filthiest part of the human body. Jesus made an interesting statement one time. When he talked about Judas, he said, the one who has broken bread with me has lifted up his heel against me. Ah, you see how it works. You don't expose the bottom of your feet to anyone. It's like slapping them in the face. It's a deadly insult. So for me to wash the bottom of your feet is very, very humbling for me to do and very honoring on your part for me to touch your dirty feet and make them clean. The second gift of hospitality that I would give you is right there on your table. I would give you a cup of cold water. The Bible does speak about it. Where do you get cold water? Now this jug, this terracotta clay jar, which is unglazed, is very, very old. In fact, this one happens to be about 3,000 years old and it is not a replica, it's real. It's a wine jug. But a water jar would look very much the same as this, perhaps a little larger. And what they would do to cool their water down is they would put water in this unglazed jar and then they would put water on this unglazed jar. And what would happen is on a very hot day, the water on the outside of the jar begins to evaporate rapidly and when it does, it drops the temperature of the water on the inside, and on a 110 degree day, I can pour you out a glass of water that's about 70 degrees. Now, you see, I've given you a cup of water, your feet are washed, you're still gonna be seated down there, of course, but what I'm going to do now is anoint your head with oil. This is a welcoming anointing. This is something that's very honorable, and I would have a little vial here of olive oil, scented like roses or other spices. It smells really, really good. And I would come up behind you and I would take the whole thing and I would pour it out all over your head while you're seated at my table. Yeah, there's nothing in there, it's okay. And then I would come up behind you and I would begin to massage it into your scalp. 
And so you are anointed with this rose-scented oil. And by the way, having your hair lank with olive oil in those days, that was the in thing. Because Roy, thank you, you can sit down. Because when you're walking home, and Roy is going back to his house, and he's walking through the village, and people see him with his hair all lank with olive oil, they wouldn't be going, ew. In fact, they would be looking at him, and they would say, somebody loves that guy. That's how important it was. The fourth gift of hospitality, very, very practical. You see, what I would do is that somewhere in my house, and, and the rooms weren't very big if I was a peasant. The room would be barely bigger than the table you're sitting at. It's quite small. But I would have a little charcoal fire burning. Probably I've been cooking off of this fire. And I'd take a little pinch of incense and I would sprinkle it on the fire because I want the room to smell nice. Roy smells nice. But I want my house to smell good for you too because frankly, my house doesn't smell very good. It hasn't ever smelled very good because, well, I have animals. And there's predators in Israel. Predators in those days like bears, lions, jackals, hyenas, leopards, some of which still exist in Israel today. And of course, there are always thieves and robbers, and, and of course, animals not being very smart, they're still going to wander off. So I'm going to bring them the safe place I know where to bring them, right into my living room at night. Well, when you stepped into my house, I mentioned that you kicked your shoes off and you stepped over the threshold. Well, why do you think they call it that? It holds thresh. The house is full of straw and dried, matted weeds and what have you. Why? Well, shall we say, for obvious reasons, having animals in the house. Tonight, when you eat, you will eat with your right hand. Now, why am I telling you this? Because in just a moment, I'm going to invite you to begin eating with a couple of rules. And the first one is this. You will only touch food with your right hand. You will not touch it with your left. There is an exception, and I'm going to tell you what that exception is later on this evening. But in the meantime, you can touch any basket, any bowl with both hands because you're not touching the food directly. But when your food, your fingers come in contact with any food, it's only your right hand. This is what they did in those ancient times. Why am I telling you this now? Because, listen carefully, with the exception of the grape juice, don't drink the grape juice, and the bread, don't eat the bread you can begin to eat anything that's on your table. And I invite you to just nibble away while I talk. We're going to look at tonight as if it were the Last Supper. And the Last Supper being a Passover, what well, we know it was a Passover because Jesus told his disciples on his way into the upper room, he said, I long to eat this Passover with you. So we know it was a Passover. And there, of course, in the upper room, when you were to come in and look at the Last Supper, you know what you'd see, because, of course, you've seen it before. You know what the Last Supper looked like, right? It looked something, well, like this, didn't it? Now, you have all seen this picture before. You've seen it in a lot better form than this quite possibly the most magnificent painting ever painted in the history of the world, Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, preserved quite poorly, unfortunately, on a chapel wall in Milan, Italy. The Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci. You see, the Jews, well, first of all, when they celebrated their Passover, the Passover was always to be celebrated at night. Look at the painting. Leonardo's got a nice bright blue sky. They're doing it in the middle of the day. They're eating at a long elevated table. The Jews never ate at long or elevated tables. Jesus and all the disciples are sitting in nice, big, tall, high back chairs. The Jews barely knew what a chair was. And if they sat on anything off the ground, it might have been a low bench or a short little stool. And that's about it. Jesus, the host, is sitting right in the middle but the host never sat in the middle at any very important banquet. Not only that, but if you look under the table, they're all wearing their sandals. Very bad manners, folks. And of course, you know that a main course of the Passover was lamb, but Leonardo, he painted fish. And of course, the most important item on the table was to be unleavened bread. But Leonardo liked those little Italian dinner rolls, so he put those on there instead. 
Oh, it's a tremendous painting, folks, but it really is absolutely pathetic theology. You see, the Jews in Jesus' day never ate the way that we would eat. In fact, again, they would sit down on the ground and just sort of squat down, perhaps around a little cook pot, and they would put their food in there and they would cook it over a charcoal fire and then they would just, with their families, eat around the cook pot. They were very, very poor. If they were a little bit more well-to-do, then they would have perhaps a mat made out of, oh, straw woven together or palm leaves and they would sit on that. But the people in Jesus' day were very, very poor. In fact, about 80 to 85% of the people were so poor that they only ate meat once a year. And that was the Passover because there they were required to eat lamb. Other than that, they got by with whatever they could. They were very, very poor. And they ate on the ground. But by the time of Jesus, the rabbis had come up with a whole brand new custom. And the custom was interesting. They said that once a year, every Jew was to eat one meal like a rich man. And that meal was to be the Passover. Well, folks, what you are all sitting at tonight, these weird low tables, these tables are shaped in the most likely shape of the actual Last Supper table. This is a rich man's table. Now, let me explain this to you. I'm going to put my back to some of you. Please forgive me on that, but you have a U-shaped table. This table is called a triclinium. Tri three-sided, clinium, reclining table. Now, I'll explain that to you in just a minute, but it's a three-sided table. You notice how low to the ground it is? Well, actually, the ones that you're sitting at over here, that's about the right height for a real triclinium table. They're very, very low to the ground. And it's a rich man's table. Why is a triclinium a rich man's table? Because of its U-shape that you see here. You see, if you had a triclinium table and you were eating at it, you would eat around the outside of the table and nobody sat in the middle. The U was for servants to serve you. And if you had servants, you were rich. Josephus Flavius, some of you may have heard of him. He was an historian who lived a number of years after the time of Christ. Josephus, in his massive writing, his histories, records many events of the Jewish people, but he also records some incidental, some little things. Well, one of the little things that he happens to mention is that he describes a room that's furnished with one of these tables. A room for special feasting purposes, furnished with a triclinium. He calls that room a ketaluma. Just sort of off the cuff, mentions it in his histories, that a room at the triclinium table is called a ketaluma. Let's get on with the story. And that's what he does. Now let's back up. Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, verse 10. Jesus tells Peter and John, the day of the Last Supper, that morning, Peter and John, I want you to go into the city. There you will find a man carrying a water jar. By the way, only women carried water jars, so this is a clue. I want you to follow that man to his house. There he will take you to a large furnished upper room. Make preparations for the Passover there. The word that Luke used, the word that Jesus apparently invoked, was ketaluma, the same word that Josephus used years later to describe a room furnished with one of these tables. So it stands to reason, our first clue is that the Last Supper table was shaped like the table you are around right now. But how do you eat at such a table? You're all sitting around the table, you look quite comfortable, uh, as much as you can be on the floor and you're munching away, but I can tell you right now that there isn't one of you in this room that's eating the right way. And I'm not gonna ask you to do it because it's kinda hard to do, but this is what they did. Let me show you how they ate at a triclinium table. They reclined at the table, and it looked like this. The table was right here at my shoulder. Not in front of me here, it's here at my shoulder. And I would be leaning on my left arm because I'm not gonna eat with my left arm. And I'm going to be eating with my right hand, so I'm kind of twisted like this. 
eating food off the table. And as I'm around the table, everybody around the table is in the same basic position as I am, one person looking into the back of another going all the way around the table like rays radiating out from the table. Notice where the dirtiest part of my body is, my feet. As far away from the food as I can put it, out by the wall. And as I'm here eating at the table, I am enjoying my time. Everybody is in the same position as I am around the table. And we're eating and we're telling jokes and we're telling stories and we're singing songs. We're quoting scripture. We're playing games. The feast was always a great time of tremendous rejoicing as we are reclining at the table, eating like rich men, whether it's a Passover or any sort of another feast. And as it gets later on into the day or into the evening, of course, I can't go home. I can't walk outside with one of these oil lamps or a torch it's not practical there's no way to do it but of course my boss isn't waiting for me the next day remember time means nothing to these people and so I keep on eating away and we're telling stories and singing songs and I begin to get tired but you know I'm reclining at the table and there's well there's a pillow along the table and there's a nice soft mat here underneath me and that's a pretty nice place and so well you know I think I'll just uh, take the rest of the night off and I go to sleep right at the table. That's comfortable. And then I sleep through the night. I wake up in the morning. I'm on the mats. There's the food. There's people sitting around having a great time. And I begin to continue the feast. And the games go on. And this revelry would continue for a wedding feast for seven full days. If it were a coming of age feast or some other special occasion, it could go on for as long as two solid weeks. Folks, nobody wanted to miss a feast in the days of Jesus. Now, the Jews reverenced bread. They looked upon bread with great respect. You'll notice that I am handling food with both hands, including my left hand. You see, the Jews were very, very practical when it came to their traditions about food. Yes, you only ate with your right hand, but you also held bread with both hands. Why? Because, number one, it's too precious. You reverenced it too much to touch it with just one hand. And secondly, it was considered evil and wickedness to cut bread with a knife. That was considered ingratitude to God. To express gratitude to God, you would take the bread and you would break it, for which you needed two hands to do that. So tonight, you will touch bread with both your hands. You'll hold it gently respectfully. In fact, if I wanted to pass bread to you and Pastor Vic said, Jay, would you please pass me the bread? Well, I would take the bread and I wouldn't just go here. I would take it in both hands and reverently and with respect, I would pass it to him with both hands because I am giving to him, and this is the Jewish mindset, I am giving to him that which is life to him. The Jews equated bread with life. Now you can say any ancient civilization would possibly do that because, of course, if you didn't have bread, you starved. Bread is life. But to the Jew, it was much more than that. You see, this goes back to the Passover. They treated bread with such reverence and respect because when the Passover occurred and they went out of Egypt and across the Red Sea and See, swallowed up Pharaoh's army, and there they are standing on the shore looking back across the Red Sea at the land from which now they came from, and now they're free and they're out of bondage. They are now standing on the shores of one of the worst wildernesses in the entire world. It's a vast, dry place with no water and no food. And by the way, those that left Egypt, there's a couple of million of them, a huge group of people. How are you going to feed them all? God had it all figured out, didn't he? God gave them what? Manna. God gave them what? What is it? What is it? No, that's what manna means. What is it? They'd see it on the ground. What is it? And then they call it manna. Manna means what is it? But they did call it bread, didn't they? It was the bread from heaven, they called it, because it was miraculous. Every morning, six days a week, not on the Sabbath, they were to get up and go gather this stuff that appeared with the dew on the ground that they called the bread from heaven. And it was very nutritious to them. They could cook it in all kinds of different ways. And it was called manna, the bread from heaven. And it kept them alive, wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. It was their life and it was given from God. Now, 
put the pieces together. Think about this scripture, and you're going to need to remember this for later on. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness, but they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. I am the bread of life, Jesus said. And this bread speaks of him. The Jews, when they prayed over a meal, prayed the same prayers every single time. At the beginning of the meal, however, they always prayed the same prayer. Now, here is the prayer that they would pray. First of all, the way they prayed is different than us. If I were to say to all of us now, let's pray, well, you would bow your heads and you would close your eyes and perhaps fold your hands, a very Christian thing to do. Not so the Jews. If they were to pray, they would look up towards heaven and with their eyes open. And then they would hold the bread up before the Lord and they would pray this prayer. They would say, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us bread from the earth. That's the prayer. And they would have prayed that same prayer at any meal exactly the same way, including the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let's pray that prayer together with our eyes open and looking up towards heaven. Let's hold the bread up towards the Lord and let's pray this prayer one phrase at a time after me, the same prayer that Jesus would have prayed any given time over any given meal. It goes like this. Please join me in prayer. Blessed art thou. O oh Lord our God, King of the universe, who gives us bread from the earth. That's the prayer of Jesus over any given meal. And you did it well, except for one problem. You did it in the wrong language. Let's say the prayer of Jesus in the language of Jesus, just the way he would have any time he prayed. He would have looked up towards heaven and lifted his bread up, and he would have said, Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech ha'olam hametzei lechem min ha'aretz. Your turn. I'm not making fun of this prayer. Don't get me wrong. I reverence it. But understand this, that that is the language of Jesus. Those are the words that he would have said in the way he would have said it. And I'd like you to try and repeat that after me. And even though you don't know the words, mean it from your heart, just looking to the Lord. And let him pour his blessings out as we bless him. We hold our bread up before the Lord and we say, Baruch Hata, Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Hametzei Lechem, Min Haaretz. And then to say amen, you tear off a small bite-sized piece and you eat it. Now, <clears throat> if you would, I'd like you to put your bread down and please pick up the cup of grape juice that's there in front of you. And of course, they would have at the Passover a cup of wine. It would have been fermented wine, but watered down four parts to one. Nobody is not only allowed to get drunk, they're not even allowed to get buzzed. So they did drink wine, but drunkenness was always a big, big sin. So they took measures to make sure it didn't happen. And Jesus took the cup and he would have held it up. And he would have prayed this prayer, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. A little bit different. Let's pray this prayer, the prayer of Jesus over the cup, one phrase at a time after me, holding it up before the Lord, eyes looking up towards heaven. And we say, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. In Hebrew, Baruch Ata, Adonai Eloheinu, Melech HaOlam, Bure Pri HaGafen. And your amen is to take a little sip. Now before I ask the servants to come in, I'm going to hold them off for just a moment, serving the hot part of the meal. I want you to connect a few more dots. What was Jesus' first miracle? What was it? 
turning water into wine. Now there's something interesting that happens in this that John assumes you know as you read this. And if you knew this, it would make all the sense in the world to you. You know the story. The wedding feast which goes on for seven days has gone on for at least a few days. Jesus is probably not in the main room as far as we can tell. And Jesus' mother Mary comes up to him and says, Jesus, they've run out of wine. Jesus answers politely. Woman, what does that have to do with me? My time has not yet come. That doesn't exactly sound polite, but it really was a polite response. Mary doesn't even speak to Jesus again. She turns to the servants who are somewhere in the back of the room and she just says, just do whatever he says, and she leaves. One thing I wanted to point out, those were Mary's last recorded words, chronologically speaking, in the Bible. Do whatever he says. I love it kind of does away with a lot of theological problems. Well, do whatever he says. Well, Jesus is now left there with the servants. And so he says, okay, well, there are six large jars. Fill them up with water and ladle some out and take it to the master of the feast. And so they fill up these large jars that are used for ceremonial cleansing. I mean, they're like five-gallon buckets made out of stone. They're quite huge. And they filled them up with water, probably took them a little while. And then one of the servants ladles some out into a wine cup. Folks, this is a wine cup. This is a real wine cup. This one is the same shape, roughly the same size as wine cups of Jesus' day. The style didn't change much in those times. This one happens to predate the time of Jesus by about a thousand years, and it is authentic. This is not a finger-dipping bowl. This is actually a wine cup. And so look, I found the Holy Grail. Here it is. This is what it would have looked like, something like this. And so they would have ladled some wine into here and then taken it to the master of the feast and the servant takes it to the master. The master tries it and he says, where did you get this? This is the best wine I've ever tasted. Where did this come from? Nobody serves the best wine towards the end of the feast. You put out the good wine at the beginning and then later on when people don't care so much, you put out the bad wine. This is wonderful. But here's the point. You see... At the beginning of the feast, the master of the house, who was given that cup of excellent wine, would have also proclaimed the blessing. And he would have held the cup up on the first day of the feast, and he would have said, Blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who creates the fruit of the vine. And it just so happened that O Lord our God, King of the universe, was in the next room, and he answered that man's prayer and created the fruit of the vine. Now everybody pick up your piece of bread if you would and I'd like you to tear off a small bite-sized piece, hold it in your right hand and do not eat it. Bite-sized piece, small, hold it in your right hand, don't eat it. Everybody got it? Now what I'd like you to do is take this piece and even if you don't have your stew in front of you and you can pretend, I think you all have it, dip it into your stew you hold it up and you reach around to the person on your left and you stick it right in their mouth. Now, I need to tell you something. You're all giggling and snickering and laughing and smiling a lot, and you should be. I have presented the biblical dinner on six different continents, and I can tell you right now that everybody reacts the same exact way. They just laugh and giggle and snicker when you do this until you tell them what you just did. What did you just do to that person you put that food in their mouth? When you take a piece of bread and you tear off a piece of bread and you dip it into a stew or something else in front of you, which we'll call the sop from now on, you dip it into a sop and you put it into somebody's mouth, you are saying to them, you are my brother or sister and I would die for you. It's a big thing. In fact, you put that bread in their mouth and you are saying, not only are you my brother or sister, but I love you. I respect you. I honor you. I highly esteem you. And in some cases, you are saying, I forgive you because meals often speak of reconciliation. It's a huge honor. In fact, it's quite possibly one of the greatest honors anybody could ever be given in life 
is to have somebody come up to you and put bread in your mouth or for you to put bread in someone else's mouth that has been dipped. It's an enormous honor. Never underestimate the power of that moment. There on your table, you've been eating a lot of this now, you have dried fruit, including dried apricots, prunes, raisins. You also have dates, which are absolutely delicious if you haven't tried them. You have nuts, of course, protein, which they needed, including walnuts and almonds. You have honey. Dip your bread into the honey. It's delicious. You have another substance on your table that's right here that looks kind of chunky. It's called haroset. And you would have had this at the Passover. It represented the mud between the bricks that the children of Israel made when they were in bondage in Egypt and how God made their suffering sweet. It's made out of apples and honey and dates and cinnamon all mixed together and you dip your bread into it. It's absolutely delicious. You have hummus on your table. You can dip your bread into that or the vegetables in it. The vegetables, by the way, make very, very excellent spoons and you can eat the silverware too. And so you can use that with your stew. Also on your table, other items including fresh fruit, which is washed and ready to eat, and you can enjoy that too. And the rest is for you to discover. When you folks came into the room tonight, many of you who have never been to a biblical dinner before made your way around a table and you sat down right where it was comfortable and you made yourself at home. The disciples would never have done that because they knew something that perhaps some of you didn't know. There's a pecking order around these tables. There are seats of importance. And those who sat at those seats, they were the greatest. And then there are seats that were mediocre. Maybe you were great, maybe you weren't if you sat at them. And there were seats of tremendous dishonor. Let me show you how this worked. You see this wing of the table right here. This is the VIP wing of the table. These people are the greatest. This wing of the table right here. Maybe you're great. Maybe you're not. The people who sat there, ah, they're okay. But the folks that sat here on this side of the table, ha, scum of the earth. we can determine where four of the men at the Last Supper sat. And with each location comes a tremendous lesson. This person right here, second from the end on the left-hand wing of the table right here. This is the seat of the host. This is where Jesus would have reclined at the table at the Last Supper, right here. Now, knowing that, because that's where the host traditionally sat, or reclined, we have this person right here at the end. Has a very interesting title. It's a long title. This person is known as the best friend of the host, the doorkeeper, and the protector of the host, which implies something along the lines of being a bodyguard, which is exactly what this person was. You see, this person is required to protect the host if somebody comes into the room with ill intentions towards the host. Let me show you how this works. You see, you would be reclining at the table. This person right here, reclining at the table. The table is here. It ends here. He, this person has an unobstructed view of the door. You see the U-shape of the table? Every open U at a triclinium table traditionally always face the door. So this person is facing right into the door. And if somebody comes through that door with ill intentions towards the host, what do they have to do to protect the host? Well, first of all, they're the host's best friend, so they're reliable. But secondly, if somebody is coming in to attack the host to protect them, all they have to do is lean back. And they fall physically right on top of the host. They become a physical human shield to protect the host from harm. They are the host bodyguard. But more than that, you see, they are prepared to protect the host because this person also has a sword. Now, you may be thinking, wait a minute, they didn't have swords at the Last Supper. Oh, but they did. In fact, at the Last Supper, you find that at the very end of the supper, as they're about to go out to Gethsemane, Jesus makes a very interesting comment to the disciples. I'll paraphrase it for you. 
you've had it really good here while I've been with you, but it's going to get rough. And he uses this expression, now you're going to have to go out and buy swords. The disciples, dense as usual, think he's talking literally, and one of the disciples reaches up and says, look, master, here are two swords. There were two men in the room with swords, and one of the men in the room that had a sword was not here, so somebody showed up hoping to sit there and brought a second sword, and they produced two of them at the Last Supper. But this person would have been required to have a sword. Who is this guy? Well, he gives us a clue because he even tells us who he is. You see, if you're reclining at the table, and the table ends here, and Jesus is behind you, and you want to talk to Jesus, all you need to do to speak to Jesus is lean back. And your head is on his chest, and his head is right here, and you are talking. This is the disciple who leaned on Jesus' chest. This is John, the disciple who leaned on Jesus' chest. And yes, he had a sword. Now, there's another person that we need to note at the table, and that person is over here. This is the seat of the guest of honor, the person to the host's left. We have the right hand of the host, we have the left hand of the host. This person, guest of honor. Don't take it personally, but you are also Judas Iscariot. <laughs> now, you may be thinking, like most people would, what is Judas doing in the place of the guest of honor? In fact, how do we even know that he was there? Well, it's quite simple, actually. You see, there in the middle of the Last Supper, at one point in the evening, Jesus makes this startling, earth-shattering announcement that one of you here tonight, at this table, is going to betray me. Well, the disciples immediately erupt into a chorus. So, Lord, is it I? Is it I? Is it I? And they go around the table, and they're not getting anywhere with this. John leans back on Jesus' chest and says, Master, who is it? Jesus straightens himself up. He reaches down and picks up a piece of bread, breaks it off, dips it into the sop, reaches around to his left, and puts it into the mouth of Judas Iscariot. In John chapter 17, he prayed for Judas as Jesus was praying, and he called Judas in that prayer the son of perdition. There is only one other person in the Bible who was ever called the son of perdition, the Antichrist. Judas was not a nice guy. He was not a poor, misunderstood patriot. And when he went out, it was night. But here's the other side of the story. You see, when Jesus tore off that piece of bread, and he took the bread, and he reaches over, and he puts it into Judas' mouth. And when that bread went into Judas' mouth, Jesus sent this message to Judas. Judas, you are my brother. Judas, I would die for you. In fact, I'm going to tomorrow. Judas, I honor you. I don't honor anything you're doing, but I honor you. Because even if you are my enemy, I am your friend. Judas, I love you. Judas, I forgive you. And he gave him every last opportunity to repent, knowing that he would not do it. You see, there's something else I didn't tell you. At the very beginning of the meal, when the host would take the bread and pray over it and break it, what he would do, the host, nobody else but the host, would pray over the bread, blessed art thou, O Lord our God, King of the universe, and so forth. And then he would tear off a piece of bread as his amen, but he would not eat it. He would dip it and put it into the mouth of the guest of honor. And that actually officially opened the feast. It began the feast. It initiated it. So Jesus put bread into Judas's mouth, not once, but at least twice that night. At least. He showed us how to love our enemies. The last person at the table, we know their location, is right over here. Peter! 
Peter is at the scum of the earth seat at the scum of the earth wing of the table. This is the worst seat in the house. Now, the question is, what is he doing there? Peter liked to be first. In fact, he'd be the first person to tell you that he should be first, and he's not only last, he's dead last. What is he doing there? Maybe Jesus said, Peter, I want you to sit there. And Jesus sat him there. I personally believe that's what he did. Peter probably questioned, why, Lord? Peter, sit down. You will understand later. And so Peter takes his place here, but he doesn't want to be there. Not at all. Now, let me ask this before I tell you why he's there and what's going to happen. Where did Peter want to sit? I have a theory. I think Peter wanted to sit right here. I think Peter wanted to be where John was. I believe that Peter considered himself Jesus' best friend. I think Peter wanted to be the protector of the host, but Jesus somehow got him over here. Why do I think Peter wanted to be here? Because later on that night when they went out to Gethsemane, Jesus said, I want you to watch and pray. And for about three hours, they prayed and fell asleep. Jesus was the only one who stayed awake the whole time. That when Peter was startled awake by the guards coming to arrest Jesus, that he jumps up and he grabs the other sword. And he hacks off the ear of the high priest's servant, a fellow named Malchus, and he hits him from behind, by the way. So he's not chasing a soldier, he's chasing a servant. And Jesus puts the ear back on Malchus and heals him. And he says, Peter, put away your sword. I think Peter wanted to be here. Because what was Peter doing in the garden? He was protecting the host, protecting his master. I think he intended to be here. Somehow, he ended here. And he didn't want to be there. Why? Because you see these objects here that are used for washing feet? These were right here at this table. And when there were no foot washing servants or slaves present to wash everyone's feet, then the great dishonor of having to wash everyone's feet fell to that guy right there. And by the way, everybody's feet at the table are still dirty. He's not doing it. I am Peter. I am no foot washer. If you guys want your feet washed, you're going to have to do it yourself. John chapter 13 tells us that at that moment, Jesus showed his disciples the full extent of his love. Not some of it, not a lot of it. The full extent of his love. What did he do? He gets up from the table and he walks over to this end of the table here. He strips himself down to his loincloth. He picks up a large linen towel and he wraps it around his waist just like a foot washing slave. He takes up the basin and the pitcher and he walks over to this side of the table and remember all the disciples' feet are sticking out behind them towards the wall, radiating out from the table, making it very easy to get to. And beginning with John, he begins to wash the disciples' feet and wipe their feet on the towel that's wrapped around his waist. Think about it. You are wiping somebody else's feet on your clothing that you are wearing. How many of you would do that? And yet that's what he's doing with the towel that he is wearing now as his outer garment. He washes John's feet. He washes Judas's feet. Judas is still there. He hasn't left yet. Peter is horrified. He says, are, are, are you going to wash my feet too? Jesus said, Peter, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but later you'll get it. Then Peter says these immortal words. No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. I don't think that he was put off by the whole thing. I think he was horrified by it. And then Jesus knelt down, and with the basin and the towel and the pitcher, he washed Peter's dirty feet. Now, that may be an amazing or even sentimental moment for you. 
But it goes way beyond that, folks. Think. Think. Connect the dots. Peter is the foot washer. And Jesus is now washing a foot washer's feet. Oh. Just when you thought there was no lower form of life on earth than a foot washer, someone comes along and washes a foot washer's feet. And he washed Peter's feet. And in doing so, and this is even more marvelous and stunning and mind-boggling, that the Son of God, God wrapped in human skin, becomes the foot washer to a foot washer. By the way, one more thing I wanted to add. I think Jesus put Peter here for a reason. Because Jesus said the greatest in the kingdom is who? The slave of all. If that's the case, what is the greatest seat at this table? Right here. After his resurrection... Almost all of Jesus' appearances involved our favorite subject here tonight, food. I find it interesting that when Jesus appeared there in the room that where the disciples were locked that we talked about at the beginning of our evening, that he said, Shalom Aleichem, but the next words out of his mouth were, got anything to eat? And they gave him food, and he ate it. The next week, Doubting Thomas is back in the room. He appears again, and he says, Shalom Aleichem. Next words out of his mouth. Got anything to eat, guys? And he ate with them. Think about this. All of his disciples deserted him. To a man. We say, well, John didn't. John followed at a distance. He was afraid to get close until the very end. They all deserted him. Many doubted him. Not just Thomas. It said some doubted. More than one. They doubted him. One of them denied him. And following the instructions of the Lord, the disciples went north after Jesus' resurrection up into Galilee where Jesus said he would meet them. They arrive in Galilee and Peter makes an announcement. He says, I'm going fishing. Now that doesn't mean... I'm going to go drown a few worms, and in the morning I'm going to feel better about things. It means I'm despondent, I'm depressed, I'm discouraged by this whole thing. I hate myself over it because, man, all the stuff I've let the Lord down so bad, I quit. I'm done being an apostle. I'm done being a disciple. I'm going back to my old job. If anybody's coming with me, come now. And he goes back to his old fishing job. He gives up. And by the way, when he went back, he took six of his disciples with him, including John. And they put out in the Sea of Galilee from Capernaum, about 100 yards offshore, and they throw their nets out of the boat all night long, and they don't catch so much as even a guppy. The sun begins to rise in the east over the Golan Heights. In the gray twilight of the morning, they notice there's a man standing over on the shore about 100 yards away. They can't see his face, but he's looking at them. They can tell that much. The man scrutinizing the boat puts his hands to his mouth and says, Caught anything, guys? Great. No! He puts his hands to his mouth again. Throw your nets out the right side of the boat. Great. John, maybe he knows something we don't know. They throw their nets out the right side of the boat. They begin to pull them in. And it's the largest single catch of fish these professional fishermen have ever netted. They start pulling the fish into the boat. They can't get the net into the boat. It's too full of fish. The fish are flopping around. The net should be snapping and breaking, but miraculously, the net holds together. They start trying to drag the net into the boat. The boat begins to swamp. What are we going to do? There's too many fish. Wow, this is amazing. This is... And suddenly, John gets it. He looks at the man. He looks at the fish. He looks up at Peter, and he says, Peter, this reminds me of Luke chapter 5. Peter, it's the Lord. And Peter dives into the water and he leaves the other guys with the fish struggling and he swims the short hundred yards to shore and as he pulls himself up out of the water, there's Jesus on the shore 
And you know what he's doing? Making breakfast. And there around that little charcoal fire, Jesus ate with his disciples fish and, by the way, bread. And after he had eaten with Peter, he said something to Peter that I don't think Peter thought he would ever hear again. When Jesus said, now, Peter, you follow me. And he was reconciled back to Jesus on the shores of the Sea of Galilee with one of these. The last thing I want to talk to you about tonight, it'll take a few minutes, but it's worth the journey, is that meals often speak of reconciliation. I need to show you a concept. I would like you to pay very close attention to this. I'm going to go over here to Roy once again. Now, what do I have in my hands? Bread. How many pieces of bread do you see? Now, this is a trick question, okay? How many pieces of bread? Okay, very good. I pray for the bread, I break it. How many pieces of bread do you see? One! This is one piece of bread. It's just in two pieces, but it is one piece of bread in two halves. Now, that's the way they think of it. This is still the same piece of bread. I just broke it, that's all. Now, let's say that Roy and I had a quarrel. We got into a vicious argument. We're really mad at each other, but we're also friends and we don't want to be mad at each other anymore. And so the Middle Eastern mindset says this, to reconcile, we need to break bread with each other. And the way it works is this. I come to Roy and I say, Roy, I am sorry, I, I did a bad thing, I confess that to you. Will you break bread with me? And if he wants peace, then he would say, yes, I'll, I'll break bread with you. And so I pray, I break this one piece of bread into two parts, but it's still one piece of bread. I hand him half of my bread, I take the other half of the same piece, he eats his half of the same piece of bread, I eat my half of the same piece of bread, and in doing so, the piece of bread goes into his body and becomes part of him, the same piece of bread goes into my body and becomes part of me. And now we are related to each other by this piece of bread. The broken link between the two of us has now been reforged in the form of bread. We are now connected to each other by this. It's part of him. It's part of me. We are now one with each other. We are now related to each other. And for me to be mad at him is like me being mad at myself. That's stupid. That's foolishness. And so therefore, we are reconciled. And whatever the quarrel was between you and me, it's now forgotten forever because we are one we are made new, we are made one by a piece of bread. And the last thing is this. If you're at odds with somebody, you've had a quarrel with somebody, a Christian, a friend, a brother or sister, a relative, just a suggestion. Make them a meal, take them to lunch, pull out a piece of bread, break it, and break bread together. You say, oh, but they wouldn't understand what that means. It doesn't matter. You do. And in the words of an old rabbi, it takes two people to reconcile, but it only takes one to forgive. Break bread with your enemy. Let God take care of the rest.